I think, to be honest with you, people form an impression of him and then they get to know him and they change the impression of him. Tiene todo su glamour, pero sobre todo es lo que es por lo que hace en el campo. Who else could have done that? I can't think of anyone else who would have kept their bottle because that's one chance, you know? I wasn't prepared for how good looking he was. I mean, he's an exceedingly good looking man. I call him Golden Balls, you know, now because I mean. <laughs> he's just starving hungry to lift the World Cup and bring it back home. He's a great captain and he's certainly the man and the example to other players. Everybody knows David Beckham. He's the most famous footballer in the world. But what do we really know about him? As a lifelong football fan, I've read all the stories. And like everyone else, I have my opinions. But then he invited me into his world. I spent the best part of five months with him, saw the truth behind the headlines, and met the people who know him best. When we get inside, I'm going to have an in-depth football discussion with him. Oh, shit, you can ask me about offside, aren't you? What follows is an exclusive look into the real world of David Beckham. Whatever has happened in my life and whatever we've got, we are normal people. I'm Tim Lovejoy and I'm in the Spanish capital, home to one of the biggest clubs in football, Real Madrid. I'm going to watch a game and see their star player. And on the way, I'm having a chat with one of the most famous women in the world, who also happens to be his wife. OK, we're on the way to the Bernabeu. What's your routine like? How, how often do you do this? Well, you I go to all the home games. In Spain, you don't go to away games, not even the hardcore fans. It's just, it's not like in England where the fans travel. So I go to all the home games, and if it's an early kickoff, I take the children. If it's a late kickoff, I don't, because they have school the next morning. I mean, me and the kids love coming. I mean, the boys love it, they really do. And how do the fans treat you as you're sort of going through the... You actually have to walk a bit into the stadium, don't they? Can you believe I have to walk? <laughs> I can't believe it. Posh I can't believe has it. to walk. It's crap, that. But you have to walk through the fans. How do, yeah. they, uh, how do they treat They're you? They're really nice. I mean, I've got to say, you know, even in England, when I go to England games, you know, I mean, the fans are really supportive. The public are really supportive. You know, uh, the fans and the people in Spain have made us really, really welcome. Are we near the stadium now? We are, right? We're not far. Why, do you want to buy a flag or something? <laughs> yeah. Do you want oh, to buy a know, scarf? Do you know what I like is when someone scores a goal in, mm. uh, in England, we go, yeah, over here it's goal. It's just a different noise. Yeah, it's probably because they speak different language. It, do you know what? Do, that's, you that's, do you know what? I think you might have sussed it there. That's a good point. There are 80,000 fans inside the Bernabeu Stadium and Victoria is as impressed as any of them. He's so talented. I mean, I always say to him, God, it would be so... I wish I was that talented. And he says, you are. You are. I said, no, I'm not the best singer, the best dancer. I will always admit that. But to have that natural talent like he has is fantastic. The search for talent is where all good football stories begin. And that's why, five months earlier, on a cold November morning in South London, I joined the World's Press to take part in an important event. It's cold, isn't it? It's cold. How you doing? You all right? You all right? Yeah? How you doing? The kit looks good. It's the launch of the David Beckham Football Academy. If you all had the day off school? Yeah. So you're all happy then? Yeah. You feeling OK? Good. <laughs> this is just one of the special football scores he's opening for children around the world. You seem to have a lot of empathy with children. Do you think some of that empathy might be because, unlike adults, you can all make money off the back of you? Children are there because they like you and they, they sort of appreciate your football talent and who you are as a mm. person. No, definitely. That's, that's the best thing about, you know, working around children because they are honest. You know, if you... If you've played a bad pass, they'll tell you you've played a bad pass. If you've done something stupid, they'll tell you, you know, and that's, that's the great thing about working with kids. You're not nervous, are you? What are you going to be like when you're playing at Wembley? Yeah. This is uh, a dream come true for me. To see the kids here today, my dream has uh, become a reality now. 
I went to the Bobby Charlton Soccer School and I had such a, an amazing time there. You know, it kept me out of trouble. So I wanted to create, you know, something like that. And it's kids of all levels, isn't it? It's not just the elite. Yeah, that's one thing that was so important to me. Yeah, if we find, you know, great players that go on to be professional players, and England players, then amazing. But, you know, the most important thing is kids come down and have fun. The Academy in London is the new home for David's precious collection of football memorabilia. This was one of my first Man United shirts that my mum and dad bought me for Christmas. Uh, they used to buy me the United shirt and United kit every, every Christmas. My granddad used to buy me the Tottenham kit, so <laughs> it's a bit difficult because we spent Christmas morning at my mum and dad's house and Christmas afternoon at my nan and granddad's. They're the famous boots where you scored yeah. from in your own half, yeah. which not many people have done. I believe Pele hasn't even done that. Here's the time for Manchester United with Beckham! That's absolutely brilliant! It's such an unusual goal. That ability to be able to kick the ball that far, let alone be on target and see the keeper off his line, all those things, it did catapult him onto a different level and uh, you know, I think it went a little bit mad. We move on to the uh, probably the best shirt you've got in your collection here. It's the one where you scored the free kick last minute against Greece to make us qualify for the 2002 World Cup. Yeah. That's pretty impressive, isn't it? You haven't washed it. No, I don't wash the shirts because I think they're more authentic. But, uh, you know, I, definitely this was one of the most probably emotional days in my career. Beckham could raise the roof here with a goal. I don't believe it. David Beckham. There's something kind of perfect about that goal. The timing of it, the dying seconds. To the World Cup Finals. If he hadn't scored that goal and we'd been cast into the playoffs, who knows what would have happened, whether we would have qualified. And there was a lot riding on it, so it was, it was an amazing moment. Well, mate, you know, who else could have done that? Can't think of anyone else who'd have kept their bottle from that way out, knowing exactly where he was going to put that ball, because that's one chance, you know? And it's all the over, you know? And that's amazing. Should have been Sir David Beckham after that, really, shouldn't it? When you reach that ultimate high like that, yeah. is there a down which comes with it? Oh yeah, I had that the morning after when I went in for training with United, and uh, and Ferguson's uh, Alex Ferguson was like, okay. Ferguson was like, okay, it's a goal. <laughs> no, <laughs> but he's Scottish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There was never anybody who could kick a football like him. You know, he could kick a football miles. His technique in kicking a football was unbelievable. The one thing that, you know, he always had, he had quality. You know, if the ball had to be delivered into an area, he could deliver it. There's a lot talked about team spirits in dressing room, but for about four or five years, from 96 through to 2000, 2001, the spirit was absolutely incredible at United. Do you think you could have stayed at Man United all your life? Yeah, without a doubt. I expected to and thought I always would. I genuinely believe that David is, you know, still probably upset about the fact that he's left United because, you know, he loves the club. He grew up loving the club. You can't grow up from the age of four or five, you know, having something as being part of your life and then, you know, expect that it's not going to hurt you. People were saying that I was having talks. I was already talking to Real Madrid. I never talked to Real Madrid until I actually got the phone call to say, you know, the club want to sell you. And that's, what, that's the first time I spoke to Madrid about that. And, you know, I never, ever expected to leave United. Did it hurt that the guy who's brought you into the team, made you who you are, kept your feet on the ground when you scored the goal against Greece, mm. protected you, looked after you, suddenly doesn't want you? A lot. A lot. I think that's what, that's what hurt at the time because, as I said, everyone knows that I'm a Man United fan and Man United mad and I never, ever, you know, I think, I think at the time when, when, when I signed for Real Madrid and when I got home, I think I actually cried because... You know, it was Man United, it was a team that I'd been at for, for, for my whole life. In 2003, David Beckham left Man United and signed for Spanish super club Real Madrid. But, as I discover in part two, whether it's Spain or England, in David's life, one thing is always the same. <laughs> it's like Beatlemania, isn't it? <laughs> It 
It's been three years since David Beckham moved to Spain after signing for Real Madrid. The next time we meet, it's for a meal out in the Spanish capital. It's my opportunity to see how well the locals have taken to him. Sí, un poco. Sí. No mucho. Por favor. Sí. Gracias. So in Madrid, um, where are we? This is one of the first restaurants I came to when I first joined Madrid. And since the day I stepped in here, they never let me pay. It's nice, but it's embarrassing as well. I get embarrassed for things like that. So. I leave a big tip. I do leave a big tip here. And I was going to say, are oh, you popular in Spain? But the reaction when you walked in here, <laughs> yeah. um, you're doing all right over here, aren't you? They, yeah. they, do, they do like you. And the reaction over here is great. You know, people are so passionate about wanting to see you. And they're very touchy-feely over here. You know, that's, that's, that was one of the problems with the story where the girl was getting my autograph. Um, because in Spain, you know, it's rude if you don't do two kisses. Even the men, you know, the men like grab you and want want to hug you and, and kiss you. You know, that's that's the way it is. Mm. If ever it stops, you probably won't miss it, will you? People staring at you everywhere you go. Probably not. Probably not. But yeah, I, I don't know because I've never been in a situation where I haven't had it. I suppose he's really the first guy who's taken it on a level since George Best, really. The obsession with his lifestyle away from the pitch has certainly reached new levels. Come on! I think Bex embraces it, you know. I don't think at times he likes it, but I think there are times when he does like it, and I think that's fair. I think he'll accept that. I mean, being out with him and, you know, leaving a restaurant, you know, it's like leaving with the sort of Hollywood superstar. He doesn't get annoyed, but he just gets slightly frustrated because he just wants to live a normal life, and that's the real David. You can't just pop out for a pint of milk, can you? Not really. Does I that? do like to do normal things like that. I love going food shopping. I love food do you? shopping. Yeah. What, in supermarkets? Yeah. Like the, like we're moving into our new house, so I went the other day um, to get all the utensils and all the, the new kettle, and, thing, and I love doing things like that. But when you were, like, the other day you were photographed in the papers wearing sort of like, as they were saying, a cowboy outfit. Poncho. Yeah. Poncho, you're wearing a poncho. Now, you know, when you wear that out, you know everybody's going to pick up on that, don't yeah. you? Is there a bit inside you which is giggling to yourself, going, this is quite funny, I, mean, I, I like what I'm wearing, but I'm going to get absolutely slaughtered oh. tomorrow? I mean... Not really. I don't think about being slaughtered, you know. I, uh, I just wear something, if I like it, I'll wear it. It doesn't matter whether I think, oh, tomorrow I'm going to get caned. You know, if I like something, I'll wear it. Like that, I liked it, and I was given it, and... It was great, so I just thought, sod it, I wear it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a stylist? No. So yeah. you choose your own yeah. stuff? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Bex has always had stick from the players since he was 16, 17, since he, you know, updated his leather and his, you know, his under prelude. You know, everyone else had, you know, normal seats. He had to have extra leather, you know, and he wouldn't let anybody go in the back because he'd scuff his leather. And you know, He's always been like that, and he's always obviously took the brunt of jokes on, le on things like that. How about the guys then in the team? Do you ever do, do like, I know the English players yeah, obviously go on a male yeah. bonding thing? It's not as much as you used to do in England, but like every now and again we'll go out for a meal, we'll come to a place like this. So you, you, do you drink when you're out here? Do the players not drink? Really. Not really. Not a, it's not a huge amount. You know, I, I love red wine, so mostly red wine I drink. I'm not a big drinker, to be honest. At Real Madrid, David plays with the world's football elite. Together, they earn an eye-watering £98 million a year. This star-studded lineup has been christened the Galacticos. Do you have to sometimes pinch yourself when you're looking around your teammates yeah. in that Madrid team? I mean, an incredible selection of players there. Could you pick one out as being the best? Zidane. You know, the Brazilians are great. Ronaldo's unbelievable. But for me, Zidane does things that are like... He's got so much respect through the changing room. Yo creo que ha aportado lo que lo que tiene todos los ingleses, la, la voluntad de, de nunca dejar las cosas, siempre siempre ir a más. Ronnie, when he's on the pitch, he's, he's incredible, but he's such a nice person, so normal. Una persona increíble que está siempre bromeando, nunca le ves de mal humor. 
pase lo que pase, en el momento que sea en su vida, pues está siempre con la, una sola inside. Obviously the English fans, you know, they, they uh, pinpointed you when you played for Man United, sung songs about you. Do they do that over here? Do the fans sing songs yeah, about the players? Yeah, they do. But do you understand them? Yeah, yeah, yeah they, get... sing, they sing, um, uh, 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 they sing Beckham Maricon. What does that mean? Be which is Beckham Faggot. <laughs> <laughs> which is, uh, <laughs> which they sing about me and about Guti. Do you think of Madrid now as your home? your home yeah you do yeah we've we've finally found a house that we like here we found an area that we like it's in the same areas where the kids school is and uh, you know everything's settled down I think it's important for people in Spain in Madrid to see that I'm actually you know I want to I want to learn the language I want to settle down here my children are happy here my family's happy here I'm happy playing football here <laughs> David was so relaxed during our meal, I'd almost forgotten that his every move is monitored by the press. So while I left through the front door, he had to escape out the back. When you're this famous, everyone wants a piece of you, and even our meal together makes front page news. David suffers from this terrible affliction that's within our society now, that's the, the celebrity. Now, at least David's done something to earn that celebrity, beyond buying earrings or putting on a crap television show. I mean, he's actually achieved celebrity because he's the best at what he does. How do you think your relationship is with the press is like? What do you think it's like? I think it's quite good. You know, I think that I've had my ups and downs like, it, like most people. But, um, you know, I've, all the bad stuff that's been written about me, uh, most, most of it is, uh, is my personal life uh, and, you know, People don't know me, so they can write what they want. What I find out hard to believe is why journalists do believe that we're more interested of the crap side of someone's life than actually the genius of what they are. But star footballers are considered public property, and none more so than David Beckham. Whether it's playing on the pitch or being involved in his many off-the-field commitments, the cameras are always there. And so are his fans. I think the majority of people that I come across in Madrid are really nice, you know, want autographs, want pictures, um, but just really nice to me that, you know, they'll come up and talk to me and it's good because I, you know, I want to feel, especially to people over here, you know, I want to feel approachable and, you know, I do, I have had people come up to me and say, you know, we don't think that we can come up and speak to you and talk to you and ask for an autograph and, you know, and that's just because of what either they've read or they've heard or, you know, some story that, you know, is, is not true. So, you know, I think that's what's nice about the sort of the public and the attention that I do get over here because they actually come up to me and they talk to me and, and that's a good thing. So they, do they know you in this, in this coffee yep. shop, yeah? they know, I don't even have to ask for what, for what I have because I have the same every day. <laughs> every day, vanilla latte, extra hot, extra extra hot. They can't understand and believe that I have it so hot, but... Do you want a coffee? Hi, <laughs> thank you. Sure? Yeah. Two donuts for the boys. They love the donuts, so... Driving is a sort of release for me. You know, it's a bit of normality. You know, it's something nearly every person does every day, drive to work, so... You know, that's, that's my way of having some normality in my life, if possible. <laughs> like going to the grocery store, things like that. I was at Manchester for 15 years and, you know, training with the likes of, you know, Keeney, uh, Brian Robson, Steve Bruce. You know, everyone's flying into tackles, winning headers, everything, you know, and that's, that's the way I was brought up. But, you know, it is totally different here.
go and work hard. You enjoy yourself. Right, I'm sure you'll be able to film from now on. When Madrid signed Beckham, some claimed it was for his commercial pulling power rather than his footballing talent. Sure enough, shirt sales immediately rocketed, and despite three trophyless seasons, Madrid have now overtaken Man United as the world's most valuable club. But Beckham is arguably their best player, and is a huge hit with the fans. He has been their best player, I think, for most of the time he's been there, actually. It's been unfortunate that he's arrived at a club at the end of an era, really, I think, and, and, and at a time when players like Ronaldo and Zidane and Raul are approaching the end of their careers. With Real in a transitional period, the rumour mill is working overtime. But whatever the stories, one player seems happy to stay. You know, the only club I would have ever have gone to, apart from Manchester United, was here. You know, I don't want to play. There are other great clubs in England, of course. You know, there's Arsenal, there's Chelsea, uh, there's Liverpool, there's other clubs, but there's no other club that I would rather play for in England anymore. Uh, you know, it's... It's here or Manchester United, and that's that's the way you know that's the way I feel about the situation. To be honest, what about Arsenal? No. I hear you're signing for them. Apparently so. Okay. Apparently so. David has arranged a real treat for me, something every football fan would die for. Right. I go first. Yeah. Something which few are allowed to actually walk on the hallowed turf at the Bernabeu Stadium. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah. When was the first time you played here? Uh, it was with Man United, Champions League. We got battered. I don't think we knew what had hit us. Then, first time I played here was against, uh, I think it was Malaga in uh, the Spanish version of Charity Shield. First time I touched the ball, the whole stadium started clapping. So it settled me down straight away and then I played a couple of long balls which worked and then uh, I scored a goal from Ronnie's pass. It's a good, good reaction there, Dave. It's, it's like Beatlemania, isn't it? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I weren't around at that time. How was it? <laughs> It's good. It must be great getting that reaction off people, isn't it? It is. You know, like the reaction when we went into the restaurant. I think, uh, you know, you can't you can't beat that sort of reaction and that sort of love for for a person. And uh... <laughs> it is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> One of them said, "Te quiero, te quiero." I love you. <laughs> One of them said, te quiero, te quiero. I love you. <laughs> and how was it your first match out here? Because obviously uh, you didn't speak Spanish and not a lot of the players spoke English, did they? So how did you actually communicate with the players when you're playing? I think once you're on a pitch and once you're, you're playing with these players, you don't really have to speak too much, to be honest, because you know these players don't need to talk on a football pitch. I know... You know, in coaching manuals and when you're kids, you know, people, managers and coaches are always like, you know, talk, talk, keep talking to the players and telling. But with these players, you don't need to communicate that well because they know where you are, they know what to do. I know where they are and where they like it and that's the way it works. To play in this stadium is so special, so special. You know, it's like playing at Old Trafford. You get that feeling of, you know, you never want to come off the pitch. It's uh, it'd be a fitting place to end your career here, wouldn't it? Yeah. It's. Do you think this is where it's going to end? I think so, yeah. I think so. Because at the end of my career, I want to be known as a player that has played at a top level um, for the best teams. And they don't come much better and bigger than Manchester United and Real Madrid. I can imagine. Coming up in part three. You 
know that I love driving, so I have to have something that excites me. The highs of being David Beckham and the lows. These are the guys that follow us day in and day out. Follow your kids, follow your family, follow your wife. For me, it's, it's taking it a step too far. The next time I see David Beckham, it's on a jet back to the UK. It's a chance to quiz him about private air travel and his new hairstyle. It's convenient getting these, isn't it? Very. It is nice to have this and it's, it's great. Yeah. You know, I do love it. Why'd you get your hair cut? Did the wife tell you to get it cut? She wasn't loving the long hair, I must admit. And to be honest, if I'd have known what everyone else was thinking, I'd have done it earlier because since since I've had it cut, they're like, seriously, we're so glad you've cut that long hair off. And when are you, when are you developing the haircut for the World Cup? Are you uh, actually, do you actually think about it? Because no. you did, didn't you, with your Mohica? Did you plan that one? No, not really. No. Not just... really. I was just, I was bored and I just thought, why not? Just, just do it. How did that go down with Sir Alex Ferguson? He told me to shave it off. <laughs> he come over, he said, what the f... He, what, what is that? And he went and got me a, a, a razor. I think it was Fabian's, Bartes's. And he said, go and get it off now. So I was in, like, in Wembley, in the, in the <laughs> toilet, shaving my hair. Good, well, I, I just, it's a good day, actually, to get you, because it is a Sunday, and we got the Sunday papers back in England. Oh, and what, what, is, what is great about this is you'll, you make it into every paper. Do you know that? Really? Now I had the opportunity to see if what the newspaper said matched reality. We had on film the exact moment a headline was created. The headline, boasting Beckham torments Arsenal, came from this press conference. They're a great team. They've got a great manager, they've got great players. Um, you know, they might not be playing well at the moment. It sells papers. They don't want to hear me saying how great Arsenal are and how great their players and how great Arsene Wenger is. You know, I'll just come out with something like, you know, it might be a bad time for them, and then they've turned it into something else. Beckham, I can't do Brooklyn's homework. A massive whole page, on page three, yeah. of, of, of how you can't do Brooklyn's homework. You said, you, you said this tongue-in-cheek. I said, in jest, you know, Brooklyn's homework is so hard, sometimes I have to pass it on to Victoria. What is the most stupid thing you've ever read about yourself? There's too many. <laughs> I heard a rumour that you never wear a pair of trainers twice, that every time you put a pair of trainers on, they're a brand new pair. Is that true? Um, that's nearly true. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> but, but, you know, all my mates and, you know, some of my family, they all take the other trainers. It's not as if I just throw them away and, you know, actually these are my new ones, actually. I read a silly one about me the other day that I only wear my underpants once and then throw them away yeah. and get a new pair. And I was seen in El Corte Inglés in, in Madrid buying like 30 boxes of Calvin Klein, which is not true. But apparently I don't wear old it. pants, but I wear, <laughs> you know, I don't wear them just once. Another favourite subject for the tabloids is David's tattoos. Are tattoos addictive? Very. Very. Are you addicted to the... the uh, the pain of it, or you addicted Funnily to it? Funnily enough, that? I know it sounds weird, I actually enjoy the pain. At first it hurts, but then, you know, you start to enjoy the pain. The only one that was a bit sore was the one on my neck, which yeah. also caused a lot of controversy and people were saying, what is he doing, you know, has he totally lost it? I'm not a believer in tattoos through my upbringing, but I know his dad's got a tattoo, and at the end of the day, you know, if you're asking me should he have had tattoos, I would have said no. But he's had tattoos, so what at the end of the day, it's his body, it's his life, he can do whatever he wants. People turn around and say, you know, people have tattoos because they're not sure of themselves or and things like that. You know, there's a whole thing around tattoos and, you know, it, why, it why is do very, you it's a personal thing for me, it's not something for everyone else. Everyone else can see them, of course, but it's a personal thing for me. You know, when I do decide to do something, it doesn't matter what anyone says about that, whether they'll like it or not. You know, I'll, uh, I'll do it, and that's, that's the way it is for me. I could see that David takes most of what the papers say with a pinch of salt. But having witnessed the media circus that surrounds him, it must be hard to read certain headlines, even when you're so used to media intrusion. 
I think fame takes some growing into and some getting used to, you know. I think that David's matured over the years. Uh, he's understood what he has to do now. I think w when I first interviewed him, there was a kind of a, a freshness about him. There was a joy about being famous. I think he's had a bit of that knocked out of him in a sense, and, and, uh, and that's the price you pay, I suppose, the kind of scrutiny that, that, that you're under. 